Today on Impossible Engineering, the littoral combat ships, the U.S. Navy's fastest combat vessels. If you're a pirate or you're a drug runner and you see that ship coming towards you, it's time to shut down your engines and put up your hands. To create a vessel in a class all its own. She's basically one of a kind as far as warship goes. I am sailing a ship that's unprecedented. Engineers had to turn to the pioneering innovations of the past. Here we go. Yes. If these engines were to cut out, this boat would be in serious trouble. Oh, this is really incredible. What an amazing airplane. That made the impossible possible. The U.S. Navy has the largest sea force on the planet. Throughout its over 240-year history, its ships have carried out operations in the deep blue waters of the world's oceans. But today, the Navy's assignments are evolving. Gone are the days of open water Blue Navy battles. Many of the places where we need to be as a Navy are in coastal regions. To combat problems such as piracy, people trafficking, and aid distribution, the fleet must operate in shallow coastal waters known as the littorals. To navigate waters close to the shore, shipbuilding program manager Captain Tom Anderson had to construct a particular type of ship. To operate effectively in the littorals, we need a high-speed ship, and it's got to be adaptable. It's got to be capable of doing multiple missions. That's our challenge. It's a challenge that Chief Engineer Lieutenant Damon Gilbert also had to overcome. The ideal ship for this environment would be a ship that's light, a ship that has a very shallow draft, and a ship that can handle itself and move very quickly. The solution. The littoral combat ship class. Made up of both the monohull freedom variant and the trimaran independence variant. This revolutionary class of ship is at the vanguard of marine engineering. This is going to change the face of how we operate inside those, those waters for years to come. Built for speed, both the Freedom Variant's semi-planing hull and the Independence Variant's trimaran design create ultra-hydrodynamic efficiency using lightweight aluminum powered by an innovative propulsion system. Each ship can travel over 45 miles per hour in only 14 feet of water. It's capable of being reconfigured for multiple missions and it's able to deploy smaller boats. A vast helicopter pad also extends the crew's reach. But to produce a high-performance, fast-moving fleet for shallow waters, the ship's designers had to create the most effective propulsion system. The problem was, standard propeller systems significantly push the ship below the waterline and require much deeper waters. If you want to chase down a ship or you want to elude another vessel to get out of danger, you want to be able to maneuver as quickly as possible. So how do you propel a ship this fast in mere swimming pool depths? This would not have been possible without a breakthrough innovation from the past. Humans have always needed to navigate the world's shallow waterways. Initially, we used arm power to paddle. It was effective, but tiring. The Vikings added a sail to conquer the coastlines. This worked well, but only when there was wind. With its small draft, the paddle steamer seemed to be the answer. But, I do declare, but they had significant problems. Oh my! 
In the 1940s, the introduction of airboats brought high-speed travel to the Everglades. Oh, no! But a better system was needed. In the Grand Canyon, mechanical engineer Dan Dickrell is riding upstream on the Colorado River to reveal one of history's great engineering achievements. <laughs> the beautiful noise you hear right now is two 550 horsepower, 8.3 liter engines pushing this 20 ton boat up these crazy, crazy rapids. If these engines were to cut out, this boat would be in serious, serious trouble. But the key to driving against the current isn't in the engines. It's due to a pioneering propulsion system. Getting to places where others can't in extremely shallow water was born out of the imagination of someone whose childhood desire was to challenge the rapids and go where no one else could. To do this, New Zealand-born inventor William Hamilton needed to overcome the limitations of standard motorboats. Now, Hamilton had a problem with this because the waters he wanted to go on were too shallow. Huge rocks would effectively wreck the screw propeller. So Hamilton got rid of the propeller altogether. In 1954, he commissioned a plywood boat and attached a centrifugal pump to its engine, creating a unique water-driven jet propulsion system. How the Hamilton jet motor functions is around the middle of the boat, there's an intake that brings water in from whatever body of water the vessel is navigating. Hamilton uses an impeller that's spinning very fast to greatly accelerate the stream of water. That water is highly turbulent and twisty, and so the Hamilton passes the water through a series of stator veins, creating a uniform but high-velocity jet. And in 1960, Hamilton tested his bold water jet design at the Grand Canyon. Hamilton vowed to be the first to take a vessel up a 160-kilometer section of this notoriously unnavigable Colorado River. Now, it may look calm right here, but upriver, the rapids are crazy. He traveled against the current, including the notorious Vulcan Rapids, in just nine days. With his son John at the helm, Hamilton made history and conquered the mighty river. Almost 60 years later, Hamilton's water jet's sheer power. This acceleration is intense and its ability to navigate shallow waters with the added benefit of mind-blowing maneuverability. Here we go. Yes! <laughs> continues to open up new waters. Whew. Thanks to this spectacular demonstration of man versus rapids, there's this unique propulsion system was embraced across the planet. All right, let's go. The ship's engineers have supersized Hamilton's water jet innovation to create a revolutionary propulsion system capable of going 45 miles per hour in shallow waters. The way that this ship achieves that speed is through the use of two gas turbines and two diesel engines that drive a propulsion train that is propelled by water jets. At Austell USA Shipyard in Mobile, Alabama, the latest independence variant, USS Tulsa, is having her jets inspected and getting ready for launch. When this ship is going full power, there's roughly 24,000 gallons per second passing through these four water jets, which equates to the ability to fill a two Olympic-sized swimming pools in less than a minute. Not only do these massive jets generate colossal power, they also act as a rudder. 
each water jet is capable of independently being steered, which allows for a lot of flexibility and maneuverability. Like Hamilton's water jet system, water goes through four mighty impellers and discharges at high velocity. To steer, each jet's water flow is deflected by a rotating nozzle, enabling fast, agile maneuvers. And to reverse, buckets pivot over the exit nozzles, forcing the jet flow backwards. Built into the hull, these massive ships can operate in just 14 feet of water. Junior Yards turn. Next course 309. Off the California coast, Commander Mark Stefanik is harnessing this incredible power aboard the USS Montgomery. The water jet system allows me to turn and maneuver the ship with much more fidelity and a great deal more uh, responsiveness than a traditional ship. So by creating opposite forces on either side of the ship, I can actually turn the ship almost on its own axis. I can twist the ship in a perfect circle because of the amount of control I have through the water jets. The 100,000 horsepower propulsion moves this massive ship over 45 miles per hour. This is actually our full capacity right now. As you can tell, there's quite a bit of turbulence back there. And this vessel can practically stop on a dime. When I pull the ship to stern and go from full speed to zero, it's a very, very smooth transition. The entire ship just basically will stop in the water within less than a minute. By using water jet propulsion at 29 horsepower per ton, compared to an aircraft carrier's three horsepower per ton, these combat ships are the most efficient in the U.S. Navy. It's basically like driving a jet ski. This ship could actually maneuver sideways. It could pivot itself uh, by standing still. That's something totally different from any other uh, warship out there. This propulsion system is unrivaled, but to be truly trailblazing, the designers of these incredible ships must overcome more hurdles and turn to the innovations from the past. This is a special time of awesome to be flying this amazing aircraft. To make the impossible possible. Littoral combat ships. These are the fastest and most agile combat ships in the U.S. Navy. And program manager Captain Tom Anderson believes they are unstoppable. If you're a pirate or you're a drug runner and you see that ship coming towards you, it's time to shut down your engines and put up your hands. But to operate fully armed and at full speed without getting beached in shallow waters, the ships must also be exceptionally light. Every pound that goes into the ship is assessed because every pound that goes into the ship is an increase in its draft and a decrease in its speed. And USS Freedom's chief engineer, Lieutenant Damon Gilbert, had to strike the right balance. The difficulty we find with the older ship designs is the steel hull with the steel superstructure makes the ship incredibly heavy. The less weight we have, equals a smaller draft, smaller draft equals a longer sustainability without worrying about running aground, without worrying about getting into situations that we can't come back out of. So how do you build a lightweight combat ship without compromising on strength or size? To resolve this conundrum, the engineers look to the past. Humanity has always strived to find the perfect material to stay afloat. The Tamil fishermen of South Asia only needed a log under each arm. Come here. But when partially submerged, there was a catch. In the 9th century BC, Assyrian soldiers lied on inflatable goatskins to sneak up on the enemy. Although they were lightweight, 
the skins were vulnerable. Uh, hello. And push. For some, clay was a cheap alternative. A row of pots could buoy a raft easily. Daddy! Look out! No! But avoiding the rocks wasn't always possible. Shipbuilders needed a more durable material. Engineer Dan Dickrell is in Tulsa, Oklahoma, unveiling a game-changing marvel that sparked both a naval and aviation revolution. Oh, wow, what a beautiful airplane. Such an engineering icon. This is the DC-3 flagship Detroit. She was constructed 80 years ago, the oldest flying DC-3 in the world. Prior to this stunning machine, most planes were made of wood. Although lightweight, wood broke easily. And in 1931, a Fokker F-10 lost an entire wing, crashing into the Kansas prairie, killing all eight people on board. As America reeled, wood frame construction ceased, and engineers had to turn to metal. But this transition was only possible because of a chance discovery by German metallurgist Alfred Wilm. Different metals also have different weights between them. Here we have aluminum, and here we have steel. For the same size, steel weighs about three times as much. Because of aluminum's relative lightweight, it seems like the ideal material to construct aircraft from. The problem was 100 years ago, it just wasn't strong enough. To strengthen it, Alfred Wilm experimented with aluminum's chemical makeup. He introduced different metals, manganese, magnesium, and copper, in different ratios to create an alloy. He heated it to high temperatures, then quenched it. He repeated this process over and over again. But unfortunately, the aluminum was still very bendable. Wilm gave up, but when he returned to the lab a few days later, something extraordinary had happened. Something so transformative, it would go on to revolutionize military hardware across the planet. It was very strong and quite literally changed the face of aviation. Making this impossible warship possible. The littoral combat ships are the fastest in the U.S. Navy. But building attack vessels that are light enough to navigate shallow waters without compromising on speed or size relies on a revolutionary discovery. After experimenting with an aluminum alloy and giving up, metallurgist Alfred Wilm discovered something completely unexpected a few days later. The aluminum had age hardened. It was much, much stronger. Wilm's introduction of new metals chemically altered the aluminum's soft crystals. And over time, new minute crystals had grown within each one of the aluminum crystals, reinforcing the overall structure. Wilm called this new material duralumin. It was very strong and quite literally changed the face of aviation. The new alloy became known as the winged metal. And 80 years after its construction, this iconic all-aluminum DC-3 is taking to the skies once more. This is a special type of awesome to be flying this amazing aircraft. I cannot describe to you what this is like. I'm flying the world's oldest DC-3. First launched in 1935, the lightweight DC-3s became the world's first commercially successful passenger planes.
Taking inspiration from aerospace, LCS Freedom Variant engineers have used high-grade aluminum to create some of the lightest combat ships of this size ever built. The actual hull itself is steel where the superstructure or what we like to call sometimes the house where people live and where all the facilities are is actually comprised of aluminum thus saving literally tons of weight which has a direct effect on the draft despite the freedom variant being 387 feet long and 57 feet wide and with a steel hull and aluminum superstructure, the ship weighs a comparatively light 4,000 tons with a draft of only 14 feet. But engineers on the Independence variant have gone one big step further. So the L in LCS doesn't stand for little. This ship is the largest all aluminum vessel operating on the seas today. While constructing these trimaran megaships in Austal USA's Alabama shipyard, at 415 feet long and a colossal 100 feet wide, every pound counts. Aluminum has great strength to weight ratio. It's a third of the density of steel. And for the volume of ship we're building here, aluminum structure was the only way for us to meet our speed, range, and draft requirements. Taking Alfred Wilms' approach to the next level, engineers have adjusted the aluminum recipe, preparing the ship for salty waters. Aluminum alloys that we use in construction of this ship have good corrosive properties, which means unlike other Navy ships where exposed steel needs to be painted, this ship is not painted above the waterline. That saves us money and it also reduces the weight of the ship. This weight reduction helped decrease the Independence Variance draft to a mere 14 feet. And that enables us to go into waters and visit ports that traditionally our Navy ships have not been able to get into. The designers of these revolutionary ships are pushing the limits of marine engineering. But to effectively carry out multiple missions, they had to draw on more innovations from the past. Here I am aboard the ray gun. This can manage speeds of up to 28 miles an hour. To make the impossible possible. The Littoral Combat Ship, built to patrol the shallow coastal waters called the Littorals. Program Manager Captain Tom Anderson has helped take the U.S. Navy's fastest combat ships to a whole new level. Operating in the shallows require high-speed ships with shallow drafts. The answer to those challenges is the Littoral Combat Ship. Made up of the monohulled Freedom variant and the Trimaran Independence variant, the LCS's power to weight ratio is more than double that of a typical destroyer. And there's a reason the ships need such flexibility. We need to have a ship that's capable of doing multiple missions, whether it's searching for submarines, finding minefields, and detonating those mines. All these things are required for the future Navy. But to be truly adaptable, not only must these ships carry equipment for multiple assignments, they must also provide an effective platform for air-based missions. When we're conducting helicopter operations, there are limitations as far as how much pitch and roll a ship can have uh, based on the weather and environments in order to conduct those helicopter operations. So how do you marry the performance of a speedboat with the volume and stability of an aircraft carrier? To solve this seemingly impossible problem, the U.S. Navy's designers had to seek more inspiration from the past. Yeah. 
Off the south coast of England, science communicator Kate Mulcahy is investigating the origins of one of the fastest but most stable sailing vessels ever built. Here I am aboard the Ray Gun. This is a 24-foot boat that can still manage speeds of up to 28 miles an hour. It has not one, but three hulls that are designed to cut through the water to provide minimum resistance. In 1946, Ukrainian engineer Viktor Chechet unveiled this trailblazing shape at Marblehead Race Week in Massachusetts, calling it a trimaran. Although revolutionary in the yacht racing world, his design was inspired by Pacific Islanders looking to improve the humble canoe. You can still see why this design has endured for so many years. It's thin and long, which means it moves easily through the water. Also, it doesn't have a keel, so it sits quite high in the water. That means it's perfect for exploring shallow, narrow waterways. Despite all of this, it can only go as fast as I or anyone can paddle in it, which means its speed is limited. Secondly, as you can see, it's not very stable. So imagine this out on the open water contending against waves. So if I was to try and get this, I try and put one, oh, I don't even think <laughs> it would be possible without it capsizing. So not ideal. To island hop across the open ocean, the Pacific Islanders needed a new design. And what they came up with was this. This is the same long, thin central hull, but with two outriggers lashed parallel on either side. Now, when we were making this, we've used plastic tubing, but they would have been using just logs. The addition of outriggers instantly transformed the simple canoe. It's practically impossible to capsize it. The addition of the outriggers has increased the stability and also increased the buoyancy. That means that it sits higher up in the water and means it's easier to explore the shallow. And finally, allowed me to add a sail, so no more paddling for me. With these clever additions, islanders could access countless islands throughout the Pacific Ocean. Improving on the ideas of the islanders, Chet Chet used the wide, stable base to create a greater spread of sail. He also streamlined the light, buoyant hulls so they cut through the water and created minimal drag. All of this is what makes the Trimaran it's one of the fastest class of sailing boats in the world today. Employing a trimaran on a yacht is one thing, but integrating this design onto a 4,000-ton combat ship is quite another. Trimarans are really important when you're doing uh, surface warfare type events. To supersize this technology, the Navy's engineers had to make the impossible possible. Littoral combat ships are the U.S. Navy's fastest warships. To achieve maritime speeds of 45 miles per hour, engineers supersized the principles behind Chet Chet's racing yacht to create the Navy's first high-performance trimaran combat ship. And at Austell USA's shipyard in Alabama, the USS Tulsa is receiving its finishing touches. You can see a very fine-tuned bow designed to pierce waves. As we go further back, you see the hull widen. And just here to the right, you can see the outrigger. And again, just like those canoes with the outriggers, which give us that added stability, we get high speed.
The stabilized central hull with two outriggers moves the ship displacement point upwards. This reduces drag, allowing the ship to reach speeds of over 45 miles per hour. Additionally, the ship's vast width allows for an 11,000 square foot flight deck, and the vessel can accommodate smaller boats below, extending its capabilities across the world's oceans. Primarans are stable platforms, and those are really important when you're doing things like operating helicopters, launching vehicles, and conducting high-speed maneuvers when you're doing uh, surface warfare type events. At sea level, this unique engineering is clear. You get a really good perspective of just how wide the ship is and how that trimaran design provides for stability. Commander Douglas Mayer is traveling between its outriggers, also known as AMAs. We've got over 200 feet worth of AMA tunnel here. Where as the ship transits through the water at high speed, you get the very slender main body hull, and you have this AMA that's cutting the water and maintaining the ship's stability at 40 plus knots. Any other ship in the Navy, you're not going to be underneath the main hull form of the ship like this. This is a one of a kind design. In its home port of San Diego, California, both the Freedom and Independence variants of these combat ships are changing the face of nautical design. The littoral combat ships allow us to operate at high speeds in shallow waters with stability unmatched by any other naval ship of this size. And now, Commander Mark Stefanik is setting off in the USS Montgomery to patrol the California coast. Oh, he is definitely cutting the channel. Let's give him five short. Five short, five short. But in these busy waters, unforeseen hazards lurk everywhere. Got a jet ski, upper port side, 350, heading four daft. All right, I think we have a good shot at taking them down our starboard yeah, side. 60 yards, right? All right, stay as she goes. He's still moving. Uh, stay as she goes, 178. So there's a number of sailboats that we had to maneuver for, as well as some other small craft. So that did add to the complexity of the ship trying to get underway. Crowded coastal waters are just the start. Out in the, in the open ocean, it's pretty easy to determine what kind of traffic you're going to deal with because there's very little of it. When you're in the littoral environment, you're operating in the vicinity of, of very dense commercial traffic. But in more hostile, shallow waters, determining friend from foe can be the difference between life and death. Nothing is more critical to the captain's decision to either engage or not engage a potential adversary. So how do you identify an enemy in a split second in some of the world's busiest seas? To do this, engineers had to turn to one of history's most vital innovations. Stand any chance of successfully defending the country. The RAF needed a way of knowing if an attack was imminent. That is a huge problem. To make the impossible possible. The littoral combat ships, as the U.S. Navy's fastest war vessels, these pioneering ships can patrol the shallowest coastlines across the planet with incredible dexterity. But to determine friend from foe, engineers had to turn to a revolutionary breakthrough from the past. Engineer Luke Bisbee is flying in the British Royal Air Force's iconic biplane, the Tiger Moth. He's here to reveal an ingenious secret behind wartime engineering. What an amazing airplane. In the mid-1930s, around the time that this aircraft was being used to train RAF pilots, the skies around the south coast of Britain were actually a fairly empty place. But with another war looming on the horizon, the Air Ministry was facing a serious problem. 
Germany's long-range Zeppelin bombers had terrorized London during the First World War, and Britain's air defenses struggled to cope with the attack. Stand any chance of successfully defending the country. The RAF needed a way of knowing if an attack was imminent so they could get their own fighters into the air. This was a huge problem. Scottish physicist Robert Watson Watt needed to overcome this hurdle. Working as a meteorologist during the First World War, Watt detected the signals emitted from lightning by bouncing radio waves off of storm formations. And in 1935, with another war looking increasingly likely, he theorized that rather than bouncing radio waves off of thunderstorms, he could use them to detect incoming aircraft. He named his invention Radio Detection and Ranging, eventually shortened to radar, and it dramatically changed the outcome of the Second World War. This is how Watt's system worked. In front of me, I have a slinky, which is stretched out between me and a potential incoming aircraft. And to work out the position of that incoming aircraft, a radio wave will be sent out into the sky, and I can simulate that by shaking this slinky. So you can see that when I send out a radio wave and it hits the aircraft, it gets reflected back, and I can detect the aircraft's presence. Because we know that radio waves travel at the speed of light, by working out the time difference between the time that a signal is sent out and the time that it comes back, I can determine how far away an aircraft is. And this was something that had never been done before. In 1935, Watt successfully demonstrated his new system to the Air Ministry. And by 1938, the first five radar stations covering aerial approaches into London became operational. The system was codenamed Chain Home, and it relied on huge masts like this one to send radio waves out into the sky. By the outbreak of World War II, a network of 21 steel transmitters and wooden receivers were constructed along the southern and eastern coasts of the UK. It's a pretty amazing view. The chain home system was the first application of a radar air defense system anywhere in the world. And it gave the British a vital edge over the Germans. It was so powerful, it could even detect a German aerial formation over 150 miles away. And in 1939, the chain home low system was added, which allowed observers to detect not only distance, but also height. And this is a really incredible piece of engineering. later, these incredible combat ships are patrolling the world's challenging coastal environments. Captain's on the bridge. Carry on. And crews aboard the Independence variant have the next generation of Watts's engineering breakthrough at their disposal, the Sea Giraffe radar. We need a radar that kind of packs uh, a big radar punch, but in a small package. And that's what we get with the Sea Giraffe radar. Come over here, sir. Goes through the nav plan. Okay. In congested, potentially hostile waters, this state-of-the-art radar system helps the USS Independence determine friend from foe. Once we get here, we've got our critical points in for contacting uh, harbor control. Okay. It could be potentially several different small craft coming in up to 40 or 50 knots at the ship. Uh, you need to have that capability. Where there's a lot of ambiguity between the good guys, the bad guys, and the in-betweens. The Sea Giraffe radar can detect 200 airborne and up to 400 seaborne targets simultaneously. But to simplify this complex picture, its advanced radar technology analyzes characteristics such as altitude and speed to determine if there's a threat within seconds. Its ability to provide a very clear picture to the operator is what makes it special. We can separate the wheat from the chaff on a radar picture much better than a, a traditional uh, radar would. 
Even more incredible, this advanced radar system is both smaller and lighter than a typical destroyer's. It all is in keeping with our desire to maintain speed and agility, and it's a perfect fit for LCS. The littoral combat ship fleet navigates parts of the planet the U.S. Navy once considered impossible. I feel like we're doing something that we haven't done before. I truly think that this is pushing the boundaries. And this inspired engineering will continue to open up new horizons. The opportunity going forward is limitless with what we can do with these ships. I'm just so extremely excited for the crew that's going to get the opportunity to sail in the ship and take her around the world. By learning from the pioneers of the past. Yes! <laughs> upscaling and developing innovations of their own. Engineers have written a new chapter in nautical design. Making the impossible possible. She's basically one of a kind as far as warship goes. I am sailing a ship that's unprecedented. You can't find another ship in, in naval history that's able to achieve similar features as a littoral combat ship.